welcome to well Spanish 312 and Romance Studies uh 202. Um uh I'm John Beasley Murray and I'm delighted to be with uh my colleague uh Brie or uh Alvarez. And uh in both these courses, we're uh teaching this book, Pablo Neruda, 21 Love Poems and a Song of Despair. And so we thought it would be interesting and useful to have a little conversation and and talk about different perspectives and different ways uh, to approach uh, this same book. Bree, thanks so much for uh, for doing this. Um, uh, it, it's great to uh, have this chance to chat about this uh, text. Uh, I'll put it to you first. How, how would you suggest uh, approaching uh, Pablo Neruda's um, uh, book on uh, love and despair? Um, well, thank you, first of all, John, for inviting me to participate in this in this conversation. Um, as we were chatting um, before a little bit, I was saying that for me, um, Pablo Neruda is a poet that is is very enveloped in different moments of my life. And when you asked me to do this conversation with you, I started to think about what my first exposure to Pablo Neruda was. And like most students coming from the U.S. who had taken AP Spanish, I think our first exposure to Neruda was, you know, sort of the more of his later phase where he's, you know, doing odes to tomatoes and things like that. And you're looking at language and what he's doing and how he takes the everyday items that we may take for granted and really puts them on center stage. And then the context that surround them also. Um and then it wasn't until college, actually, that I was exposed to this particular book of Neruda. But beforehand, I had been exposed to his later poetry. So by the time I um, <laughs> came to this particular book, I myself was probably around 19 or 20, just like Neruda was when he wrote this book. So I found myself sort of in awe of his his way to express his emotions when thinking about a complex topic like love, which is the topic of the RMST 202 course, and just how he's sort of trying to grapple with relationships and how they begin, how they end, what happens in the middle, where memory lies, nostalgia, um, when do these feelings of loss or happiness creep up for us? Um, and so I remember reading it for the first time, and maybe I had not felt those strong feelings before. And so I had a hard time sort of understanding the depth of his feelings at that moment. But now it's a different story. I think there's so much that we can glean from different readings of of his his uh, poems. Um, so that's just kind of um, where my starting point was. So I'm I'm keen to start um, anywhere, <laughs> whatever you'd like to talk about. So when, you, when you're talking about feelings and, and emotion, obviously that's the famous definition of poetry by Wordsworth, right? Emotion recollected in tranquility, and and you get those two things, right? You get the you get emotion, and then you get the way in which it's recollected and worked over um, uh, later. So. Um, mm -hmm. That's both a sort of distancing from from emotion, and, and attempt to sort of recover it and and give it form, right? Because poetry is also about a certain a, a certain form, right? I mean, that's what distinguishes poetry from prose, for instance. I mean, prose has form too, but po poetry uh, brings our attention to uh, linguistic form in, in particular ways. I, I wonder how you see the ways in which. He uh, Neruda in the in this book, and it's true, it's it's, it's crazy. It's, it's, he's nineteen. Um, uh, this this is he, he goes on to have this you know very long career afterwards. This is one of his uh, first um, publications, and it's astonishingly successful. I, I wonder how you see the ways in which he works or reworks e emotion. And you, the, amongst the ones you you mention, a sort of nostalgia, which is also a kind of relationship to the past or a kind of recollection mm -hmm. uh loss um love is love an emotion oh that's a good question <laughs> um i think it is i definitely think it is um 
it's a complex one for sure. Um, but I think, I mean, speaking about the poetry as a form, I mean, this these are poems written in free verse. So even though we might see some patterns in the different poems with verses um, of 14 counts and things like that, I mean, I think he's definitely approaching it from a different way of thinking of poetry. This is um, as much an experimentation, in my view, on how to use poetry as a form as it is how to bring complex universal topics into, into um, focus for a very diverse audience. Um, which, which Neruda's, you know, I don't know how many translations are out there in how many languages this book is translated, but it's, it's vast. Um, but if you think about, um, just taking as an example, how he uses language to reconstruct memory or how to, how he tries to get us to think about what love is and what it represents. If you think about the poem, poem six, I remember you as you were right just in the title, um, linking to nostalgia, this idea of a memory of someone, how they were, which, you know, in Spanish or in English, the were is a definite cutoff from the present. It is it is how you were. It is not how you are to me now. And he uses um, images from nature, like autumn, um, dry leaves that are falling from the trees. He uses colors that are lacking in color, gray. Um, he describes stillness the stillness of night. And then he contrasts all of these sort of mute um, seasons, feelings to his bonfire of awe, his thirst for more, his deep longing. So he's sort of situating the poetic voice, el yo lirico, as we would say in Spanish, in this sort of fury and frenzy. Frenzy is a word that appears a lot in the frenesi in the Spanish translations, but in English, it's often kind of uh, translated as madness and fury, but I don't think it captures the same spirit of like, what do you do when you're panicking and you don't want these feelings to go away, but then you're faced with a statuesque, unresponsive subject, right, of of your love. And so I think that, that comes out quite a bit. Um, he, he refers also to memories made of light, but also smoke. So he's constantly contrasting these lights and darknesses, the days and the nights um, with the feelings that he has while he's recalling um, this love or these loves, if they're meant for to represent his memory of multiple experiences in life. So there's a sort of narrative arc here, right? Isn't that in which, um, uh, in which he goes through these series of uh, of feelings and, and emotions and sort of re returns to them from the sort of frenzy, the, the kind of madness, through to the despair with which the mm -hmm. book uh, uh, ends and, and nostalgia and, and, and so on, uh, as you say. Um, and, and in which he sort of, I don't know, is it sort of in, interrogating or, or, or the the feeling, right? The, the affect or, or different kinds of of passions um and then i'm interested in, in the fact you say though that the that the the subject or object that is loved is often kind of like a statue in fact it's often okay. compared to a statue right it's often mm -hmm. we, we don't we, we get much less sense of of what the beloved might feel uh and, and sometimes it, it it's as if neruda is less concerned about that. I don't, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I think I agree. I think the concern here is not um, us, his audience, or even who he's speaking about. I think that that voice is much less um, in his mind when he's uh when he's his poetic voice is coming through. And I think that can be sort of a chocante, like it can jar us as readers when we realize like this is a, a passive recipient of the, these of these messages. Um, but at the same time, I think that he also expresses this power that this absent subject has over him. And sometimes I think he's referring to love in general as this emotion that is, or emotion, I don't know, you asked me if I thought it was an emotion. I'm curious <laughs> what you think now, because um, I think it's a feeling he can't p 
pinpoint. He tries with metaphors. He tries with adjectives. He tries with verbs that are very action oriented. Um, when he seems like he has control, he's he's contemplating the female body. He attacks it. He goes after it. And then he's left with this smoke. Right. So it's it is his memory that he's reconstructing and he's trying to tangibly grasp on the one hand what the relationship was and what it meant and on the other hand why he feels so badly and alone now right and he doesn't ask her what she thinks but there is um there is one poem where he actually he speaks to her right it's poem 10 or we're assuming it's a her i i assume it's a her um in spanish there are references um through the language of, of what the poetic subject may be or who it may be, but um, the poem is titled, We Have Lost. So there's a we there, but mid, midway through the book, he starts to sort of bring her in and, and think about like, you know, what is it that we've lost? Nobody saw us at night while we're walking down the street holding hands. Nobody knows that we existed except for us. And then when when he's actually sort of coming to terms with the fact that he's keeping this memory alive through through his words and his actions, he says, where where were you? Where were you to defend this love? Where did you go? You blew up in smoke. You know, you always, always are so far away from me when I need you. So I think part of the absence, and he even uses the word absence throughout the first part of the book, the absent eyes, the absent touch. Uh, he knows she's not there. This is his memory. He's remembering, right? But then he can't avoid it anymore. And he starts, it's almost like he's going through the stages of grief in a way. He's now come to terms with the fact that she was there and she's not remembering. And where is she? Um, why did she abandon him? And and I think it just comes comes through even more strongly um, as he goes, goes through the different phases, right? Like even, um, another famous poem is poem 15. I like for you to be still. Me gusta cuando callas. And in each of the stanzas that he goes through, he's working through these different juxtapositions. On the one hand, she is still an absent and he likes that she's still an absent because he imagines that she's not speaking because he's filling her mouth with, with his kisses. Right. And then on the other hand, he's, he's trying to understand how to reach her through her silence and, and express to her what, what he's feeling. Um, he describes her as a faraway star. She represents sorrow for him. Um, he wants to be quieted by her silence. He wants her to be there, right? So I think um, he's trying to get to a point where <laughs> he can imagine what it was like with her. And he even ends that poem saying, you know, I'm happy that you're not dead. <laughs> you know, one word, one smile, this, this leaves me with happiness. I'm happy that you're out there, right? So he's coming to terms with it, but then he swings back around to a very sad space uh toward the song of despair right but um and one more point i guess is the presence of the song is another constant throughout the book and i i interpret the song as also that hope that uh not that that the love will be recovered but it's this hope that this did exist and that this will exist again and um it's kind of beautiful how he he likens like birds and liberty and freedom with these songs that that he hears from a distance and and sort of associates it with that memory in a way so I, he, he in some ways uh yeah he he's he, he speaks and, and and the beloved doesn't for the most mm -hmm. part or the beloved uh the beloved's words are much more uh in smoke, as, as you suggest, right? I'm, I'm much more uh, hard to um, uh, to touch, I'm much more intangible. And in fact, as you say, in, in poem 15, <coughs> the famous, me gusta cuando callas, I like for you to be still. Um, 
uh, it, it's that you know that seems to be his preference, right? His preference seems yeah. to be that that she should she should be quiet, right? She should be still, and 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 that he will he will fill that that silence, right? He he will fill that um, uh, that absence, um, and 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 then in the I wonder what you th- you think about the poem, uh, the the penultimate poem. Poem twenty, the last of the poems before the song. Tonight I can write, um, yeah. in which I mean it always seems to be sort of ambivalent because, on the one hand, it's it's this is this is where the beloved is abs- is definitively absent. It's not even the the fantasy of her absence, which is which is what you get in in poem fifteen, the fantasy of her death at the end of of, of poem fifteen. Uh, here, the poet seems to be definitively without her. But it seems to me, it seems to me an affirmation as well. You know, in the Spanish, the first that's the first word, puedo. Puedo escribir yeah. los versos más tristes esta noche. You know, I can write the saddest uh, lines tonight. And so mm. uh, even though the, the, the woman's no longer there, and to some extent she was never quite there, uh, now mm. the poet is able to... Fully, in some ways, take her place, right? To 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 write, to write the saddest lines, to write the twenty poems, the twenty love poems, and, and the and the song of uh, despair. Mm-hmm. I I wonder. Uh, I mean, sometimes it, it, it you know my my worry, I suppose, about this book is that the woman has now done her job. What mm. and, and, and and you know the the woman is there's something dispensable about the woman here hmm. so that um the point of the book right, was to be able to get to that point where he could say okay i've been through this i've come through this and now i can write right to mm-hmm. construct himself as a poet which is what actually happens in in some ways you know sort of cynically with the with the book this is the book that makes neruda right this this is the book mm-hmm. that um that Marx is not his first publication, but it marks his emergence as one of the great poets of Chile, of Latin America, of of the twentieth century, mm-hmm. and the 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 woman was briefly needed, or the figure of the woman was briefly needed, but again, it's it's all about Pablo. That's a really interesting read of this, right? I think. Um just to kind of take a couple of these points and I'll build it into the the poem itself that you referenced. Um, his first book was called Crepusculario, which has to do with twilight. And I, I do interpret that first book as his journey to find his voice, his poetic voice. I mean, it's his first publication. He's 18 at the time, 1923. So this book is published one year later. And the, the title isn't the same. It's not Crepusculario, but Crepusculo, the idea of twilight is throughout this book. And I do interpret this. Twilight is sort of a metaphor, in my opinion, for his finding his voice still. He's finding his voice through a different topic this time. It's not just about poetry, but I think we can look at this book of poems, which seems simple in its message, but it's actually quite complex poetically right? If you hear him read these poems, you can tell how much he's playing with the rhythms, the images, the alliteration, the apostrophes. I mean, everything that you need to know about poetry is in there, but not where you'd expect to see it, right? So there's a lot of playfulness in his use of of language, his use of um, the vocabulary in itself, how he plays um, with verb tenses to, to draw out ideas is is really interesting for me as someone who's not a native speaker of Spanish, right? I was blown, my mind was blown when I when I first saw how he played with things. Um, and so I definitely think that th- that is one interpretation that he, he doesn't need the woman. He has his muse. She is his muse. He writes about her. He writes about um, his, his journey, his journey and And, you know, we see it come out in the final um, song where he's referencing different different ways of steering the ship. Right. We we have references to shipwrecks, to flights, to pilots, to people 
managing flowing through their own journey, right? But I think another way we can look at this poem, Tonight I Can Write, um, The Saddest Lines, is he actually ends up saying, that's not what I'm doing. He says, because the reality of it is the we of that time are no longer the same. So I can write the saddest lines. I can share all of these things with you. But the one thing that matters to me, the fact that I no longer am with you is a reality. So that's another way of looking at it. You know, she's not with me and that's it. That is what matters. So my reading of it is a little more along those lines that it's kind of his his goodbye to her, but also just I've written how many poems about this now? I don't necessarily I have I've gotten through it. Um, but even just going back to the language, the way that he uses the preterite and the imperfect and the ambiguity of love. I mean, you know, I don't want to assume that we've all been there, but those of us that have been in a relationship where it's like, oh my gosh, like I love this person so much and now they don't love me. And maybe I don't love them anymore, but I still do. And it's like, there's so much in enveloped in that existence of being in love and losing the love. And when he says, Yo la quise, ella me quiso a veces, right? Like I loved her. She loved me sometimes, but that loved in Spanish is expressed in the preterite tense, which has a clear beginning and a clear end. It is over. This is it. And then he sort of recalls some of the memories. Like she loved me always with the preterite. Ella me quiso. Yo la quería. So in his choice to use the imperfect tense there, he's sort of describing it as this habitual feeling that isn't a closed door for him, right? But he has now come to the reality and the realization that the we of that time no longer exists. And so I think that's that was really powerful for me for me to see as a language learner like this poem <laughs> explains like no the door is so shut don't go back in there versus like for him i think the feelings are are still there and and i think she's still there too but i i 100% appreciate the absence of her throughout the book i think um reading this you know, one of the things you mentioned you were interested in is how do we read this book and, and this poet today, 2023. Um, and I do think, you know, there are some some things that we might look at with much different eyes from that 19 year old Neruda uh, who published this book in 1924. Well, there's so much we could more we could say uh, about this book, but I think we're out of time. Uh, this mm -hmm. is meant to be a sort of taster uh, introduction, some, you know, some ideas to to, to get thinking about this. Um, thank you so much about this. Uh, th th thank you so much for this, um, uh, this conversation and, um, and, and for your time and, and expertise. It's been, it's, it's been great. Thanks so much. Thank you, John.